we spoke about it a little bit during the during our Bernstein study, but um, there's there's some stuff still out there on YouTube, complete rehearsals of his that oh, are yeah. well worth watching. There's this one that comes to mind that I've seen where uh, it's a youth orchestra, and he's rehearsing them in the Rite of Spring. Oh yeah, not a simple piece. So that's big Holstein. Yeah. Yeah, and it's very hard to put into words without actually seeing it. But he has such a gravitas about him, and he walks up to the podium and he says. Let's all just play a C major scale. We haven't touched each other yet. Like, and so he just says, everybody just you know pick your pick your range and just let let's play it. And he conducts it in different ways. And it's just a simple scale. And he makes you know it, there's something very unique about how he yeah. connected with the music. And you can see it in a you know aged YouTube video. When he did, uh, I got to see him uh, rehearse and prepare the Copland Third Symphony. Uh, at Tanglewood, and that's really the great American symphony, and utilizes the fanfare for the common. We've we've heard it, Douglas. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and I remember the very first rehearsal. He got up and he gave the speech to the orchestra. Um, short. It was five minutes maybe, but it was so eloquent and so beautiful and so inspiring. And I remember as soon as he said, "Okay, let's start," they were ready to go to the ends of the earth for him. Yeah. Yeah. He had them. He, they were they were his. He had them. And they start playing, and the sound is so amazing. I thought, wow. Or watching him, there was a student conductor, his name was Stephen Asbury, very fine conductor, young conductor at Tanglewood, and Bernstein was coaching him in the Roman Carnival Overture. And Asbury runs through it all the way, start to finish. And I remember sitting there thinking, I had just finished my conducting studies uh, at USC, and I'm, I'm watching, I thought, wow, this kid's pretty good, you know. <laughs> What's Bernstein? What could he possibly say about this performance? What? What? It's it's perfect. And he gets up there and he says, "That's a good job there, Stefan." And he points out all the things that he likes. And he says, "I like the way you handle this. You handle that." And there. And then he says, "Let's go back to the beginning. Let's start at the beginning." He says, "Conduct the opening measures for me." So he does. And he says, "Ask the horns to do this, the trumpets to do that," and uh, and they, he does. And, they do it, and he says, "Okay, now can you bring the woodwinds to doing that?" And so on. And in about five minutes, he had the piece. The orchestra sounded like a Berlin Philharmonic. I thought, "Wow, that was genius!" Because I didn't hear anything wrong, and not that he did, but he knew how to take it from here to here. I was talking to a trombone player once. Old friend, you know, anybody know Terry Cravens? You know Terry Cravens? Yeah, wonderful guy. And he had done a performance downtown uh, with the Philharmonic. He was one of the extra trombones in Gura Leader. How many of you know Gura Leader? One person. <laughs> Gura Leader calls for an enormous orchestra, a, a massive orchestra, but about 150 players. Uh, tri th triple men's chorus, full eight-part chorus, six soloists. Uh, the percussion section calls for... Uh, has, uh, among other things, a, a set of iron chains. Schoenberg's uh, Farewell to Romanticism is some of the most beautiful music you have ever heard, especially the first five minutes. You could, we could spend hours on the first five minutes of Gura Lear. Anyway, my point, believe it or not, I have one. I was talking to Terry, and I said, oh, you did Gura Lear downtown. This was back in the 80s. And I said, how was it? He said, it was fine. And I won't tell you who the conductor was, because he's a decent conductor, but I said, how did you like playing under so-and-so? And he said, he was good, but he can only take things to a certain point. He could only take things to a certain point. He, it, we got to here, and then it never got better. It was fine, but it never got better. And I was thinking of that several years later when I was watching Bernstein take what seemed to me a perfect performance of Roman Carnival Overture and take it from here, and then suddenly it's in the stratosphere. Well, Kusevisky was able to do that. I asked uh, uh, Lucas Foss, who was in Bernstein's class at Curtis with Fritz Reiner, great conductor, very strict, hard taskmaster, and then they were together at Tanglewood in Kusevisky's conducting class, and then Lucas played piano in the Boston Symphony. He was the official pianist of the Boston Symphony for several years. He has a funny story about being at the Concerto for Orchestra rehearsals with Bartok and telling him that the piece ended in the wrong key. But anyway, he says, I was so arrogant. And he says, you know, he eventually changed the ending. He says, I can't take credit for it, but he did change the ending. Anyway, but I asked Foss one day, I said, what was the difference between Reiner and Kusevitsky? And he said, they were both great conductors. He said, um, you know, Reiner as a teacher was, was much, was meaner. He was just a tough old guy. Ooh, boy. And his player said that he could get great performances, but he was nasty. Old school tyrant. And he said the difference between them was that 
Reiner, for example, take a piece like the Tchaikovsky Fifth Symphony. He says, and Reiner had it in his bones, he says, but every time he'd do it, it was the same. He says, when you heard Kusevitsky conducted, every time it was as if you're hearing it for the first time. It was always different, it was always more inspired. He says, that was the difference. Wow. And that's the same words to say about Bernstein. Well, I mean, I think in, in composition, you look at those, the, the game changer pieces, you know, the Eroica Symphony, the Rite of Spring, uh, Daphnis, you know, pieces like with Gora Leader. Um, the St. Matthew Passion, which maybe didn't uh, change things at the time that he wrote it, but you look back now and it's just one of this magnificent masterpiece that mm -hmm. how did one human being get this out of his brain? I'll tell you another piece that I think is phenomenal that one person wrote it is Porgy and Bess. Okay? Porgy and Bess is incredible. How did this guy cut all that stuff out of that one brain, and then two years later he's dead? White Jewish guy. White Jewish guy, that's right. A white Jewish guy from New York, you know. Um, but all those melodies, I mean, talk, we were talking about Adams and his, his avoidance of melody. Let's talk about Gershwin and his non-avoidance of melody, you know. He couldn't help it, yeah. Yeah, he could not help it, so... I, I look at, at pieces like that. I, I, I wasn't here for this, but I know you studied Appalachian Spring, and that piece continues to resonate. They did a performance of it. Duda Mel did a performance of it uh, at the Phil earlier this year, and it was magnificent. And, and I remember sitting there, and I've known that piece. I've conducted it myself. I've played it. Anyway, I, it, we get to the simple gifts variations. And I have an old high school friend who was one of the clarinetists in the Philharmonic. He was playing principal that day, Bert Hara, who's, for me, the best clarinetist in the world. And he plays it perfectly. I start getting nostalgic and remembering a girl I once knew that was one of her favorite pieces, you know, all these things. And I, gradually, I, I'm starting to notice a lump beginning to form in my throat. And by the time he gets to the final chord, what I like to call the source chord of the piece, the, piece that, the, the chord that starts and ends the piece, and carves out his initials, by the way, because the piece starts in A and ends in C. So, anyway, it's his, his signature. And Dudamel, Dudamel, he pull, holds a baton out and lets the, the chord die, and then holds a the baton there for about 15 seconds. By this time, I'm enough, okay? Tears, uh, you can hear the audience sniffling. I brought no Kleenex with me, so I went trying to find something. Anyway, it was so moving, and I remember speaking with David Howard, the bass clarinetist in the Philharmonic, and saying, God, I heard the Appalachian Spring. He says, oh, God, he says, that piece, there's no bass clarinet part. He says, I was listening to it backstage. He says, we've done that piece a thousand times. He says, and every time, it gives me chills. It just gives me chills. He says, I can't. I said, I can't. That's another one, Game Changer. Mm -hmm. Just a beautiful, beautiful piece that stays with you that I wish I'd written myself. That's all I can say. <laughs> I wish I'd written it myself. <laughs>